You may be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A little bit nicer walking around outside than it was last week. Hopefully going to get better and better. Uh, before we... You, you may be seated. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we get started again, I do have a uh, an announcement. It's a it's a good thing. Uh, by agreement of the parties, exhibit SSSSS with twelve S's has been renamed Exhibit A. <laughs> so that's going to be a lot easier to deal with for everybody, I think. Uh, Sheriff, I would remind you, you are still under oath, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Bowl, would you like to resume, please? Yes, just so the record is clear, we're resuming at the 1055 mark of the exhibit. Judge, I'm a little concerned that perhaps my speaker has timed out. But with the court's indulgence, can I turn it off and back on? You sure can. Austin. Your Honor, I'm going to back it up now to the start time. You may. Mr. Rouse can verify we're back at 10:55. Verify. Thank you. I'll also find out if there's any troopers or any Warren County deputies or anything that are closed. Wander three or forty three. I showed a T car in the military area. I sent him a message. Have you yet to respond? Yeah, one three. Yeah, they contacted the CCI. They're out. Okay, so sheriff, there's quite a bit of things being said there. What's a T car? It's a DOT car, Department of Transportation car. And we heard for your forty three. What does that mean? For your information. And again, you've asked for DCI to come to the location. Yes, along with troopers and anyone that's in the area there. 132 Perry is right on the Warren Marion County line, and so I asked for the, if there was any Warren County deputies there also in the area. Traffic for Marion County. So, Sheriff, I want to take a step back there. We heard you speak, and then we also heard a click of a radio, but then also then the dispatcher come back on and say, radio traffic for Marion County. What's happened there? My, my traffic overpowered the other person's traffic there, and so she heard what I said, but she didn't hear what the other person said. And that's about... A few minutes or a few seconds before 11.40 on the tape. Does that okay. seem right? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Bolt, can I get you to stop for one second, please? Yes, sir. Um, apparently, there is an illegally parked vehicle from Warren County, perhaps a black SUV, if I'm not mistaken, that needs to be moved or it's going to be towed. So if anybody in here is in that situation? I'm guessing it may be that one of the other officers that was here this morning, Your Honor, if would you like me to try to make a call or? No, we're not going to. Okay. We're not going to. I understand. Yep. Take a break at this point. Okay. I apologize for the interruption. You may proceed. No. Your Honor, to that end, do we know whether or not the witnesses who are out in the lobby area have also received that message? I don't know. Kareem, can you perhaps let the witnesses who are waiting? Yes. Oh, they, yes. They have been aware of it. Yeah, you want to go ahead and call uh, 5 and 8 also. Get them in route. Who's five and eight? Two of my lieutenants, Lieutenant Bigwood and Lieutenant Kingery. Yeah. Yeah, you know, 
Three. Sir, it sounded like 919 on scene. Is that what you heard, or what did... Who is 919 again? That's the Melcher Dallas Ambulance, but I guess I didn't hear that. Okay. On, I just heard them with traffic. 919 on scene at 1124. Oh, yep. Now we're going on scene with no Can you repeat traffic? Yes. County 4042 confirmed address. 10 4, address 132 Perry Street, Lacona. Thank you very much. Perry County 152. 152, go ahead. Uh, we have uh, sheriff's deputies around. 10-4, we do. Okay. Who is 152? Kurt Seddon. He's one of the volunteer firemen for Melcher Dallas. Okay, so at this point, at the 13 minute and 50 second mark of this radio traffic, Kurt Seddon is saying he needs a 1079. How is that different than when it gets called in as a 1079? As a first responder, he's there and knows that there is a deceased person, so he's asking for a medical examiner. And so 1079 means? Notify a medical examiner. And before we go much further, he's actually asking, are there deputies en route, is he not? Correct, he did. And is that an example of the station or what he was scanning? He's only hearing the traffic about the rescue call. It very well could be, yes. And that may come a, be obvious, but when you're saying preserve the scene, what are you telling them? To secure the scene, to treat it as a crime scene. And is that based on the information that you had been told by Jason Carter in the phone call? It's based on all of the information in regards to phone calls, the information in regards to, I mean, um, Kurt Seddon asking for a medical examiner. It's all parts of that, but yes. Okay, Sheriff. Sounds like once again we have two two conversations going on at once. Yeah, there, there's other traffic in regards to a ambulance call that's bleeding over or that you're hearing with that, but that the message was received to five and eight, my two lieutenants, and eight was out of town. Message received to five. And the ambulance, I think it's reference 200 on this uh, audio, that has nothing to do with Shirley Carter's case, does it? Correct. There was other calls coming in. Go ahead and start making some calls to 
Call-out's just a polite way of saying you're coming to work early? Correct. Or on a day off or... So at that point, 152 again is who? Kurt Seddon. And he's indicated James Lane, who's four, has driven by. Correct. And then he used the term 1022. What does that mean? Disregard. Okay, so at 18 minutes and 45 seconds into this 911 or radio traffic, James Lane has now said he's 23. What does that mean? It means he's arrived on scene. He's at the house. So between the time Kurt Seddon got there <clears throat> and James Lane got there, there was no law enforcement there? Correct. James was the first one. One sixty seven has arrived and then the time. Who's one sixty seven? That was the other Melcher unit that we heard lead from the station earlier. Yeah, I mean, on, on thing, on thing. What have we just heard, Sheriff? The ambulance arrived on scene at the at the house. And then the time. Okay. Okay, so 63.5 has now just gone 41. What does that mean? It means he's got his uniform on and he's in his car heading to work. County wants good. Call Warren County. Also, try to go with Sheriff Boss and have it PDX name ASAP. <laughs> Sheriff, who is Sheriff Boss? He's the Sheriff of Warren County. And what does PBX mean? Call me. Why do you not just call him yourself? Well, I may have tried calling him and he didn't answer, or maybe because I was driving at a high rate of speed and it's a lot easier for me just to pick up the radio and answer a call versus trying to find his number. I don't remember exactly why on that day, but it could have been multiple reasons. Can you... At this point, as you're driving from Pella to 132 Perry Street, what are, your, what are your thoughts? What are you anticipating? What are you thinking you need to do? Well, the, the biggest thing is get as much help there as we can and preserve the scene. I mean, that's that, the, the thought process is, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, we're going to, 
I mean, is the person still there? Are they not there? Is it what? Uh, there's uh, tons of information that's going through your mind, and the biggest thing is getting as much help there as you can possibly get, so that you can start divvying out tasks and do it. You can't do it with two or three guys on a on a situation like this. You need you need people. So that's the number one thing. So one of your concerns as you're driving there is whether or not the person who committed this offense may still be there. Correct. Yeah. Or did they flee on foot? Did they flee in vehicles? Are they in the area? I mean, all those things are, are going through a person's mind. Cal yeah, SR623. 1134. So at 1134, SR6 Tim Cox has gone on scene. Right. So he is the second law enforcement officer to arrive. Correct. So I think you told us earlier five is Lieutenant Kingery. Correct. He's asking you should he go thirty three. What does that mean? Ten thirty three is running emergent or fast. And what did you tell Lights him? Said, yes, I said thirty three. Sheriff. Yes, sir. We now have approximately eight minutes left on this tape. Is it fair to say that the next seven minutes and 40 seconds is more or less silence? Correct. Yeah, there's, I mean, probably when someone arrives and shows up on scene, they go 23, and, but I would, without remembering exactly what was on there, I, I would say that's probably a fair statement. You're going to have somewhere it's what we've had. When does this tape end? When I arrive on scene. So, Your Honor, I'm going to go ahead and stop the tape at this time. Uh, rather than have us seven minutes or eight minutes of silence would be extremely long. I would agree. <laughs> <clears throat> Sheriff, can you tell us what you observed when you arrived on the scene? Well, obviously, uh, SR6, um, Tim Cox, and then Deputy Lane were doing as I asked on securing the scene. Um, Jason and Bill were out uh, in the lane coming up as, as, I don't know if to describe it or whatever, it's on the west side of the house, there's a lane coming up and they were standing there. There were some pickups in the driveway. Sir, did you c conduct any formal interviews yourself that night? No, I was divvying out tasks. Sheriff, I want to skip ahead to Sunday morning, June 22nd. May I approach witness? You may. <laughs> Sir, I've handed you what has been admitted as Exhibit 14. Are you familiar with that exhibit? I am. This is a copy of my phone records. Sir, when the jury goes back and has an opportunity to look at those phone records, are there notations, highlights, words that you've written on that document? Yes. Who did that? I did. What was the purpose of doing that? For me, when I was looking through, I was trying to um, jog my memory on who I talked to when I talked to him, but uh, um, it was names of numbers of people on my phone. Permission to publish 14 to the jury? You may.
Sheriff, are you able to see from where you are? If I stand up a little bit, I can. You already made the witness stand? You may. I'm not sure the jury's going to be able to read what's on there, Mr. Bull. I understand that, Judge. Sheriff, do these phone calls start at 619? I can't really see that far, but... Is there a notation on your records where you've dri drawn a line? Oh, that, oh yes, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about the top of the page or whatever and stuff there, but yeah, I'm assuming that that was where they started. Sir, what was your phone number at the time of these calls were being made? 641 891. Wait a minute, slow down. Oops, I'm sorry. 8079. Start over. 641 891 8079. Thank you. You bet. Sheriff, do these, the phone calls of 619, do they demonstrate the people you talk to? and when you talk to them. Yes, it does. You have highlighted an incoming phone call. At 11.21, it's highlighted, and in blue you've written Jason. That's Who is that? Jason Carter. So your phone call to him came in to you at 11.21? That is correct. Then it looks like you tried to make contact with Voss, and is that in reference to trying to get a hold of the sheriff of Warren County? Yes. Then it looks like you called someone with the last name of Thorpe. It's a trooper. And just so the jury's clear, Ed is me? Correct. I want to now move ahead if we can. Sir, I want to point your attention to June 21st. I recognize it's blurry, but the jury will have a chance to see this when they have a chance to look at it. Sir, did you receive a phone call in the early morning hours of June 21st? I did. What time was that phone call? 6.09 a.m. Who called you at 6.09 a.m. on Sunday, June 21st? Jason Carter. Tell us about that phone call. Well, obviously, as you can see by my phone calls, I was still receiving calls at a little before midnight there and hadn't had much sleep with all of this going on. I was woken out of a, I mean, dead sleep, and he... Uh, he asked me uh, if we had taken his dad's 270. And what was your response? I said, we didn't take anything as the Marion County Sheriff's Office, but if the DCI took something, it should be on the um, inventory of seized property that they would have left with his dad. Did Jason Carter ask you about any other weapons seized from the home? No, he did not. Did Jason Carter ask you if police had solved the crime? No. Sir, after receiving that call from Jason Carter, what did you do? Well, it was Father's Day morning, so I either one of two things on a Sunday morning. I either went back to sleep or I went to church, but I honestly don't remember which one of those I did but I'm assuming one of those two. At some point later that day, did you receive additional calls from Jason Carter? I did. What was the nature of those phone calls? At that point, um, he was, I, I think the whole family was pretty upset. I mean, with things that uh, they were upset that the DCI crime team had missed things. As and I don't remember exactly which one of those additional calls it was, but in the, after that, when he called back at that time, one of those calls were in reference to that. They were, he was upset. 
as a result of getting that phone call in the afternoon, and it looks, Your Honor, may I approach the Elmo again? You may. Sir, if I look here and I tell you that it says 11.28 a.m., and then it says that Jason Carter called back at 12.27 p.m., and then Jason Carter called back at 12.34 p.m., and then Jason Carter called back at 12.59 p.m., is it during this time that you're being made aware that the family has concerns about evidence being missed by the DCI? Yes, sir. What is the result? What do you do as a result of hearing this information that evidence has been missed by the crime lab? I call the agent in charge, who is labeled up there as Mark. So, and Mark refers to Special Agent Mark Ludwig? That is correct. As a result of getting that call about concerns about the crime team missing, you then started calling people. Correct. You called Mark, then you called Jason back. Is that not true? Correct. And since we're going to give this exhibit to the jury, and they're going to have an opportunity to look at it and see the nature of the calls that you've made, could you please tell us who the people are that are being called? In reference to all of them, or relevant to the case, or...? Well, the, as it relates to people whose names you've written down, it doesn't do us a whole lot of good that the jury knows you called Lisa without knowing who Lisa is. Okay, that's, that's why I was asking. Okay. Uh, it's uh, the call there at, uh, um, when, at 12, 1226, when Jason called me back, it was Jason. At 1227, um, right after that, I, it was Mark. Um, then Jason again, as in Jason Carter. Lisa is my wife. Um, Jason, Mark, uh, 357 is Trooper Thorpe. Um, Jason, Mark, um, I believe, I, I might, the handwriting there, I'm not quite sure on the one. It looks like Troy and then Caius. Um, and then Jason, and then 63-9 and 11, 63-11. So 63-9 and 11 are my deputies. I don't know how far you want me to go down. on. As it relates to Troy, is your chief deputy named Troy? Yes, but I'm not sure. I don't recognize that I mean, number as being his, so that's why I'm a little hesitant on, on I can try to find those numbers in my phone if you would like me to. to so you know truly who they are. Okay. We may do that when we get okay. to a breaking point. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Let me ask this. If Jason Carter had called you at 609 to express concerns about the investigation done by DCI, would you have rolled over and gone back to sleep or gone to church that morning? No, those calls would have been done at that time. But it's 6.09 in the morning. Are you going to wake up Special Agent Ludwig? Yeah, if it was something along those lines of, of what our afternoon conversations were, yes. Because I was pretty upset also. At some point, was a decision made to return to the Carter home, being 132 Perry Street, to discuss with the family as a whole their concerns about the investigation. It was. When did that conversation take place? The next morning, Monday morning. How you mean when, when did we go meet with them? Yes. Yeah. You met with them Monday morning? Correct. How would you describe that conversation? We took an ash joint. I'm, I, I'm, there's no, I'm sorry, or butt chewing, I, but it was, 
I mean, Bill Carter was really upset. Who else? Was other members of the family upset with you? Yeah, Jason's sister was. I mean, that I, you can say that, yeah, the family was upset. Sir, I'm going to show you some photographs that have been admitted into evidence. Benefit of opposing counsel 103 through 107. Sir, I've handed you Exhibit 103 to 107. Do you recognize those? I do. And was this the evidence the family located after the crime scene left, crime scene team left, that they were upset about? This is part of it. Okay. May I have those back to share? Permission to publish? You may. Sir, I'm going to start with this photo. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? It's a drawer on top of the gun safe. So, I know the coloring isn't ideal, but the stack on, that's the safer cabinet? Correct. And on top of it, there are items there, are there not? Correct. I can see uh, the, the yellow and green is a box of shells. Do you want me to tell you what yes, these are? Yes, please do. Um, it was a, the box of the high-powered round shells, um, the box of what they would come in. And then that there's a sack there, and then on that right... The black was scope covers. So you're talking, you're referencing this right here? Correct, yep. Yeah. Is a scope cover? Yes, it is. Okay, I'm going to, that was what number? Your Honor, that was Exhibit 103. Thank you. I'm now going to put up Exhibit 104. <coughs> Sheriff, is this just a different, better photo of those scope covers? Yes, it is. Sir, how would you describe the lighting condition in this room? Poorly lit. How would you describe the dust condition in this room? There was, there was dust, I mean, around you could see it on the tops of the safe and places. Was there any dust on those scope caps? Not that I noticed. Sir, I'm now going to show you Exhibit 105. What are we looking at in 105? Uh, it looks like the inside, it was a picture taken like of the inside of the gun safe and the inside of the door, like the locking mechanism, mechanism would be on the left there, I believe. Just so we understand, the crime scene team, when you arrive there, they have taken all of the firearms out of the safe. I uh, did. I believe so. There weren't any firearms left there? No, not that I remember seeing. Sir, as we now look at Exhibit 106, as we look down in 106, can you tell what we're looking at here? It's not a real good picture, but in the bottom of the me uh, locking mechanism there on the left is a full round. I think there's a better picture of it, but... You gave it away. Let's look at 107. All right, sorry. 107, is this a better photo of the bottom of this, as you described, I think I called it a lip, but down by the bottom where the, the locking mechanism is? Yes. Did that round have any dust on it? No, not that I remember seeing. Sir, while you were there examining this evidence, did Jason Carter make any statements to you concerning the safe itself? I believe twice he made the comment that he didn't know his dad had a safe. Sir, later that day, did you participate in an interview with Jason Carter? 
I did. Did you come in at the end of the interview? I did. Uh, for perhaps a, a simplified term, were you coming in as the good cop in a good cop, bad cop interview? I was asked to go and interview him, yes, as a friend. And was that interview videotaped? It was. Sheriff, well, actually, just so you know, we'll watch portions of that interview at a later time. The state of Iowa passes the witness. Ms. Brands, uh, sort of start where you left off. Uh, the, well, let me start first. You've known this family for a while, is that correct? I have. And you met on the 22nd with the entire family. I don't. Uh, let me phrase it. Jana yeah. Lane, who is the sister of Jason Carter. Correct with Bill Carter Sr. Correct. And with Jason. Correct. And they were all upset that there was a gun left at the scene. Yeah, I, I would say that's a fair statement. Uh, that there were, um, there was ammo left at the scene. Yes. The gun safe was not fingerprinted at that time. That's correct. There was a bullet fragment that was left? I believe so, yes. Now, at the time, the whole family was pushing for more work by law enforcement. Would that be correct? Yes, I would say so. Now, let me go back to the scene on June 19th, did you assign Trooper Thorpe to stay near the family? I did. And Trooper Thorpe was recording those interactions? I believe he was. I don't know. I, you would have to ask Trooper Thorpe on what all he got, but I'd say that's a fair statement. And we will, and we will get okay. to his recordings. At the time when you talked with Bill Carter, was he still very upset? On that day that you're talking, yes. On the 20 seconds. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's, and I apologize if I shouldn't have used that term, but the difference between a butt and a other chewing was he was very, very upset. Um, and at that time, uh, Bill was still describing the scene. Is that correct? I don't know what you mean by that. Well, he told you that Shirley was... Objection, hearsay. Your Honor, uh, may I be heard? <clears throat> well, why don't you approach? Sandhold, in your line of work, you see people who are dealing with trauma? I do. Did Bill Carter appear to be suffering from the effects of a trauma? Well, I think the whole family was. He was I think you described him as very upset? Well, I think, yeah, I, I, yeah I, it, I can't say as the effects of trauma. I think he was upset with the investigation. 
I um, mean, is what he was more upset about. I mean, it, it's all together. I mean, it's all all relevant together. But I think he was pretty upset that those items were missed. And could, uh, would it be appropriate to say he was very emotional? Uh, I, I guess when you, at, at times, when I mean, when I used the term earlier, butt chewing, I mean, there was times that he got animated and, and upset about how things had happened, um, and then at other times you would calm down. When you described Shirley and how she appeared, was that a more upsetting aspect for him? I don't, I, I don't know how to answer your question. I, I really don't, in, in regards to on what level of being upset. I mean, yeah, he lost his wife. I'm, I'm sure any time you talk about losing your wife three days after that, I mean, he was upset. Did Mr. Carter describe um, hugging Shirley? He, yeah, he kissed her forehead, he, I think he even said. And he said that she was cold and stiff. Your Honor, same objection. Overruled. Uh, I think it's admissible pursuant to Rule 803.2. That's what he said? Uh, You're asked, I guess, can you repeat the question? Bill Carter said that he hugged Shirley and she was cold and stiff. I believe that was an accurate statement at that time. Uh, in fact, he said he, that she was in rigor mortis. I do believe he did say that. He said he knew that because he'd been a butcher, and he knows when something's been dead a long time. I believe that was true. And he repeated again that she was cold and stiff. Yeah, I don't have the transcript, but if that's what he said on the recording, then I take your word for that. And he also described the blood, and he said, when you kill an animal, the blood is bright red. Um, but it was a dark maroon. I think Jason might have made that comment. Uh, and and Bill was there when Jason made that comment. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. And he didn't disagree with that. No, I, d I don't think so. And let's talk about the 270. Um, you said that Jason Carter told you about the 270. Is it possible it was Bill Carter who told you that the 270 was missing? No, you're talking about the 609 phone call? That was Jason Carter. There was a call at 609, but Bill Carter told you that the 270 was missing, didn't he? After the fact, in, in, on Monday when we were there, the discussions about the gun missing and stuff, yes. But what? the conversation on, uh, when I first, the first mention about a 270 missing was from the phone call with Jason Carter at 6.09 a.m. on Saturday morning. Bill mentioned the, the gun being gone on Monday. Didn't you say to to Bill Carter, as soon as you told me that, I called Mark. In regards to? The 270. I may have called him at a different time. So. I don't, I don't know if, if one of those phone conversations, I, I don't know if you're asking in regards to that afternoon where there was multiple, like five calls. I don't remember talking to Bill, but I could have. Well, on the 22nd, you recorded your conversation with Bill Carter, didn't you? Correct, yeah. And at that time, you told Bill, or Bill told you, when you talked to Jason yesterday, and I looked the sheet over, I said the 270 isn't there, and you replied to him, as soon as you told me that, I called Mark. That could, yes, that could be. Reports do you has the Marion County Sheriff's Department received 
indicating that Joe Sedlock, Joel Followell, or John Followell were involved in the murder of Shirley Carter? I do not know the number, but there's been a lot. I, I don't know a, a, a number off the top of my head. It's something I can find, but I can't tell you right now a number. More than 20? On, on different calls or different things? Could yes. be. Maybe more than 30? I, I, Ma'am, I can't tell you. I mean, I, the more than 20, I mean, that was even a guess on my part. I don't know for sure on how many there has been. Um, Detective Caius, my detective, would have a lot better idea of those numbers than I would because he's the one that's assigned to follow up on those. But it would be fair to say that there have been a great number of calls that have come into the Sheriff's Department indicating that Joe Sedlock, Joel Followell, or John Followell were involved in the murder of Shirley Carter. Yes, I would say that's fair. And those calls date back to shortly after the murder. Uh, what's your definition of shortly? I, I remember in the fall, I think, is when we started receiving those calls. I don't remember the very first one, but I think it was more in the September, October time frame is when we started to have those reports. And let me just step back a second. By the time that Jason Carter called you on the morning of the 21st, his family had already been provided a list of the items that were taken from the house. His father would have been, when the, when the scene would have been released, um, as I, you would have to ask a DCI agent on that, but. I don't know exactly when the DCI agents would have gave them that inventory of seized property list, but I'm assuming it was when the, the house was released back to his dad. And the house was released the day before? I think it was the, yeah, the evening, that night before. I don't know exact time. It was, you would have to check with the DCI on that. And by that time, law enforcement had, had already indicated that they were looking for a high-powered rifle. I don't remember that ever, that there was a statement about looking for a high-powered rifle before that. Do you know when that was first uh, disclosed? The first I heard about a 270 or high-powered rifle was from your client. I don't, I don't remember a, a conversation about a high-powered rifle being missing. Witness. You may. You've previously given testimony about this case, is that correct? I have. I'm going to direct you to page 176. Okay. And I'm going to have you just read to yourself, beginning at line 17. and ending at page 177 at line 8. 
Can I can I read the top part of it also because it talks about stuff up above, just to make myself familiar with it. You, yeah, you can read okay. any part of it you okay. like. Okay. Okay. Which part would you like me to read? I just does this refresh your memory? At the time of that phone call, you knew that they were looking for a high-powered rifle but had narrowed it to a particular caliber. Is that correct? No, no, you need to go up a little farther and it says, it says here, and, and uh, did he have your cell number, or your private cell? I said he did, okay, and I believe you stated that, it asked if law enforcement recovered his father's 270. I said correct, and then it says at, the, at that time when you received the phone call, I'll call it 10 after six on Sunday morning, did you know that the 270 rifle was missing? My answer was no. Did you know? Did you know that the 270 was suspected of possibly being the murder weapon? I can't. I can't exactly on on that one way or the other whether I knew. I mean, I believe there was a discussion in regards to a high-powered rifle, whether it was a 270 or not. I can't. Um, would it be fair summation that at least they are looking at a high-powered rifle being the murder weapon, but your knowledge hadn't narrowed it to a particular caliber rifle? Correct. So, so to answer, yeah, to answer your question in regards to, um, I'm sure, obviously, with the victim there, there was probably discussions in regards to it being a, a high-powered rifle being the murder weapon. I think that's what we're referring to here. So, I guess I'm not exactly sure if I'm answering your question. What, if I, I Was it was it was a 270 suspected? I can't say that one way or the other. Was a high-powered rifle suspected as being what killed Shirley Carter? Yes. Okay. Is that, that is that a fair statement? I mean, I guess on what you're asking. Well, that answers the question that I was okay. asking. So okay. So I think we're on the same page now. Um, now you were not aware of what other discussion had occurred with deputies and troopers about any of the weapons on the 19th at that point for you? That's probably a fair statement, yes. And as of the 22nd, there was a lot of evidence that had been left behind, wasn't there, at the scene? I would say that the safe, the bullet fragment, um, there was like a, I don't know if it was like an antique grenade type thing and a handgun that was up. I think those were the things I remember that were missing or that, they, that they'd missed, I should say, excuse me, but. I have no further questions. Mr. Ball. Sure, if I want to go back to some of the questions that were asked of you in cross, do you recall the question that was asked of you concerning how did Jason Carter describe his mom and he referred to her as a dead animal? Do you remember that question? Henry. Objection, Your Honor, that assumes the fact not in evidence and unfairly characterizes the testimony. Sustained. Sheriff, do you recall when you had a conversation in which Jason Carter described what his mother looked like when he found her. Well, yeah, I, I don't remember the exact words, but I, I mean, I'm not quite sure how you want me to answer that, Your Honor. I'm, I remember the conversation, but... You've answered the question, okay. Sheriff. Thank you, sir. Did that conversation take place during your interview with Jason Carter on the 22nd in the, I would say, around the 9 p.m. hour? I don't remember exactly when that conversation happened. Okay. If there's audio of it, that's probably the yes. best. Yes, yep, that would be the spot where it's at. Ms. Branstead also asked you questions about who did you talk to and when you talked to them. As it relates to the conversation at 6.09 a.m., any doubt in your mind, it's Jason Carter asking about the 270 rifle? No. Sir, 
as you were asked, I think, some questions about when the public knew, or I think you were tr maybe trying to answer Ms. Brandstead's questions about when it was released to the public about what weapon law enforcement was looking for. Do you remember that occurring? I, I can't speak for all the other law enforcement officers that were involved, but I don't remember a conversation about that being released, I guess. But what another law enforcement officer did, I, I can't testify to that. But as it relates to what you did, in July, did you send out a press release to the community notifying the community, farmers, be on the lookout if you find a yes. rifle? Yes, at that point, yes. And at that point, once that information came out that you were looking for a rifle, did that also change some of the leads that you were getting from individuals? The information, maybe, yeah. In okay. regards to, yeah, if it, when, you, when, you, you, when you have a homicide investigation and you're looking for a high-powered rifle, I am assuming people can make the connection that it was a high-powered rifle involved with the homicide, if that's what you're asking. And so I'm curious, as Ms. Brand said, specifically asked you about John and Joel and Joe and the Falwell brothers and a person named Joe Sedlock. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember her asking that. And those were individuals whose names came up during this investigation? Yes, sir. And you assigned a detective to investigate that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Nothing further. Anything further, Ms. Branstead? No further questions. Thank you, sir. You may step down. May this witness be excused, Mr. Bull? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Branstead? This witness may be excused, Your Honor. You are excused. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would uh, you like these back? Yes. Your Honor, may I retrieve those exhibits? And I'm not sure if Ms. Branstead wants her deposition back. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, sir. Uh, further evidence on behalf of the state? Your Honor, could you give us a moment, please? Sure. You want to stand and stretch? Feel free. We'll take a break shortly. Better <clears throat> whenever the state's so inclined, the state calls James Lane. Very well. Right up here, if you would, please. If I can get you to raise your right hand for me, please. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. I'm going to ask you to sit forward, speak right into that microphone. Is it still on? Check, check. Yep, sounds like it. Uh, if you would, please state your full name for the record. Spell your last name. My name is James Lane, L-A-N-E. Okay, I'm going to ask that you speak up a little more, if you would. Mr. Ball. Officer, if you would, we've had some acoustics problems. Just uh, we want to make sure we hear everything you have to say. If you would uh, use your outdoor voice and <laughs> speak directly into the microphone. Sir, what do you do for a living? I'm a police officer with the city of Des Moines. And how long have you worked for the city of Des Moines? Just over a year and a half. Prior to working for the Des Moines Police Department, did you have other experience in law enforcement? Yes. Where did you work? I worked at the Marion County Sheriff's Office as a deputy sheriff for approximately six years. Prior to law enforcement, what did you do? Prior to law enforcement, I worked in auto parts and I was a Marine Reservist. As it relates to when you worked in car parts, auto parts, where did you work? Um, the last place that I worked in auto parts was at uh, Motor In Group of Knoxville as a parts specialist. 
did you work with Jason Carter? I know you did different things, but were you there at the same time? Yes. So, did you know him? Yes. Were you on duty on June 19, 2015? Yes. In what capacity? I was a patrol officer as a, a deputy sheriff. Did you respond to a call at 132 Perry Street? Yes. Is that located in Marion County, Iowa? Yes. When you received the call, what were you doing? I believe I was taking care of a dog at large issue in the city of Knoxville. How far away from the scene were you? I would say roughly 20 to 25 miles, some, something along, along those lines. Were you familiar with 132 Perry Street before arriving there? No. Did you locate 132 Perry Street on your first try? No. What did you have to do? I initially drove past the residence and had to turn around and come back to it. Why was that? As I said, I wasn't really that familiar with the area. It's not an area we spent a lot of time in. Uh, not a lot of calls for service out there. Not a lot of crime in that area. When you arrived on the scene, who did you see first? There were two people I saw initially in the driveway. Um, that would be Deputy Chief Kurt Seddon with the EMS and Mr. Jason Carter. You said you saw two people at first. At some point, did you meet a third person? Yes. And who was that? Did you later learn who that person was? Yes. And who was that? Uh, the third person I would have met was uh, Bill Carter. And at the time you arrived on the scene, did you recognize Jason Carter as someone you knew? Yes. Where was Bill Carter when you got there? He was sitting on a bench on the deck on the south side of the house. When you arrived on the scene, did you know what you were walking into? I had an idea. What do you mean? Uh, according to uh, what we were dispatched to, it was a person that was down of uh, a possible gunshot wound. So that's what I was, what I knew I was walking into when I arrived. What did you see when you walked into the home? <clears throat> I walked in from the, it would be the south side of the house, from the deck into the kitchen. Uh, there was a female subject that was lying on the floor. Her feet were toward the door, her head was toward the north, and there was an apparent hole in the center of her shirt in the chest, and there was also some debris up by her uh, neck and jaw. Um, Could you tell how many times Shirley Carter had been shot? No. Did you see blood? Yes. How would you describe the blood? Uh, there was a, what I would call a large pool of blood um, that was apparently beneath the body that you could see from the uh, right side of the body um, that was under the left arm and shoulder area, her left side, and up by her neck on the left side and the blood was, from what I remember, was wet. Could you see blood when you first walked in the door? No. Did you have to step over her legs to get around to the front of her body? Yes. And you described it as a large pool of blood. What leads you to the conclusion that there was a large pool of blood? Well, the fact that I could see it under multiple portions of her body. Um, it was, I, I suppose I define it as a large pool is more than a simple cut that one would get. So enough that it was under the body and it was essentially outlining on the left side. Did you see any of the edges of the blood drying? I don't recall. How would you describe the smell in the hole? 
uh, smelled like, um, in, in my report, um, the way I define it is the smell of decay. So it'd be the smell of death. Um, essentially, the smell of fluids outside of the body or a good enough amount of fluid outside the body in order to smell it. Sir, is that a different term than you would use for decomposition? Yes. Are, are there, is it two different smells? Yes. So when you use the term decay, what are you really referring to? As I stated, it would be the, the smell, the strong smell of uh, fluids outside of the body. So the smell of blood, um, you know, that it's not, when you smell, when there's a large amount, a large enough amount of blood outside the body, there is an odor to it. When you were there, did you speak to Jason Carter? Yes. Did you have your audio recorder running when you spoke to him? Yes. Was there a time when your recording wasn't turned on? Yes. Can you explain that to the jury? Uh, that was approximately seven minutes from when I arrived um, on scene till I came back to my car to grab my, uh, my body mic. I had forgotten it on the charger inside the car. So the batteries don't last all that long in those body mics. So typically in between calls, I would leave the recorder on the charger and uh, be honest, it was a kind of a high adrenaline situation. I didn't think to grab it initially when I hopped out of the car. At some point, did you go back and retrieve it? I did. Did you recognize the importance of having that on when you were speaking with Jason Carter and Bill Carter? Yes. So were you the first law enforcement officer on scene? Yes. Did Jason Carter make any statements concerning who he believed was responsible for the death of his mother? Yes. What did he say? Uh, he made comments um, implying that uh, somebody had possibly come to the house, um, shot her with a, a gun, and then took the gun and left the scene. Sir, at some point, did you transition into another role that day? Yes. What was the transition that you made? I passed off the uh, duty of logging entry and exit from the residence to another officer that was on scene and had my patrol camera and took some photos of the house and surrounding area. Your Honor, may I approach a witness? Hey. <coughs> Your Honor, may I have one moment? You may. Your Honor, I apologize. I'll be referencing Exhibit 84 through 94. Thank you. <coughs> Deputy, I'm going to hand you Exhibit 84 through 94. Do you recognize these photos? I do. Go ahead and take a moment, flip through them. Start with Exhibit 84. Is that a photograph of the front of Bill and Shirley Carter's home at 132 Perry Street? Yes. Exhibit 85. Deputy, what do we see in Exhibit 85? 
another photo of the front of the residence. And Deputy, were any vehicles able to arrive or leave after you got to the scene? No. So this white truck that we see in Exhibit 85, that was present when you arrived? Yes. And that vehicle is visible from the street, whether or not we zoom in on it like we have in 85 or from a distance in 84? Yes. I'm showing you now Exhibit 86, Deputy. What are we looking at? That would be one of the windows for the residents. And is Exhibit 87 also example of windows? Yes. Why, when you're taking scene photos, do you take photos of the windows? To show if there was any signs of forced entry to any of the windows, um, to establish whether a door was used or a window possibly by a suspect. Sir, as you walked around the home, did you find any evidence yourself of any type of forced entry? No. Did you find any window screens popped out? No. Did you find any broken windows? No. Sir, now taking a look at Exhibit 88, <coughs> looks like some type of animal hutch and then uh, laying back into the, the back deck. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Is it Exhibit 89? Just a more front on of that back deck area? Yes. And we've heard reference to SR6, Tim Cox. Is that the gentleman who's standing in that photo? Yes. And sir, is that the back door of the home that you entered to make entry into the property? It is. Now showing Exhibit 90. What is Exhibit 90? That's a photo of the hog barn to the east of the building, of the residence. And sir, Exhibit 91, is this just now looking back to that space, or are we in a different location? That's from the hog barn pointed west toward the residence. Now looking at 92, Are we looking at any, what are we looking at here? It's just inside of the hog barn. Sir, did you see any feces on the sawdust when you took this photo? I, I don't recall. It, it looked fairly fresh from the photo. <coughs> 93. It's just a different pen in the same confinement? Yes. And in 94, the storage area where feed is kept? Yes. Pass the witness. Ms. Branstad. Do you know what time you took the photo showing the inside of the hog barn? I don't. When you entered the house, Clearly, you saw Shirley Carter right away. Yes. Do you also see a hole in the refrigerator? Yes. Do you see that pretty quickly? It was pointed out by uh, the Deputy Chief Seven. You also observed a gouge on the floor? Yes. And those 
Did you previously testify that those marks were both pretty easy to see right away? <coughs> yes. first saw Shirley Carter, did she appear to be in rigor mortis? That's not something I would have been able to tell. Do you believe that you said on that day that she was in rigor mortis? I believe when we reviewed the audio, uh, I did say that. It was something that was uh, told to me. <coughs> Excuse me. Not something that I witnessed personally, as I didn't actually touch the body in any way. Well, something from your observations you stated, you stated at that time that you believed that she, Mrs. Carter, had been dead for more than a, for a while. Is that correct? I suppose I would need a better definition of a while. Well, what does that mean to you? <coughs> um, more than having just been shot in front of me, I suppose, would be um, a while. It took uh, a bit of time to drive to the residence and um, from the timeline of that Mr. Jason Carter provided that he had found the body uh, right before calling his sister at approximately 11.09 a.m. that day. So to me that was um, more than immediately happened. Okay. So, you said to another officer that Shirley Carter was in rigor, correct? As I said, that was not something that I could observe myself. I'm also not a uh, forensics investigator, so it's not something that I could give a certainty when testifying to something of that nature. When you first saw Shirley Carter, were her hands clenched in fists? They appeared to be. And somewhat raised, somewhat up in the air? Uh, they were up and toward her chest. And not touching her chest, but off of her chest a bit. Is that correct? I would say yes. Now, You've done reports and given testimony in this case, is that correct? Yes. Before today, did you ever say that someone else told you that Mrs. Carter was in rigor? I don't recall. Do you know who it was that said that? I don't remember. Now, as you've watched Bill Carter did tell you that he had um, both touched and hugged Shirley Carter, is that correct? Yes. Did you review, well, you said that you reviewed your recording, is that correct? Yes. There's nowhere on that recording where Jason Carter says something about anyone leaving with the gun, is there? Yes, I believe there was. That's within the recording? Yes, I sh believe it should have been. Now, Jason Carter did tell you about um, Shirley Carter having dizzy spells, didn't he? Yes. He told you about going into the basement with his father to 
looked to see if a gun had fallen down. Uh, yes, I believe he said a rifle had uh, possibly fallen down. And both Jason and Bill Carter appeared to be upset? Yes. And let me just clarify, before you went into the scene, Jason Carter hadn't provided you with any information? No. And the two holes were something that you could independently observe pretty easily? Yes. And when you saw Shirley Carter, was the gunshot wound to her chest relatively obvious? Yes. I have no further questions. Mr. Bull. Your Honor, may we take our afternoon break? I want to have an opportunity to review something prior to redirect if possible. <clears throat> that would be a good time. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take our afternoon recess, uh, 15 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, please remember the admonition I've previously given to you. Do not discuss the case with anyone, including yourselves. Don't allow anyone to discuss it in your presence. Please keep an open mind. You've not yet heard all of the evidence. And we'll be back shortly. <laughs>